Okay, so in the last video, what we did was we showed that using the process of Riemann sums, that we could take some graph, f of t, and that we could cut it up into rectangles by chopping it up this way, and that we could construct what we think of as a Riemann sum where we compute the heights of rectangles and we multiply them by little increments. So that would be a rectangle like this. And then that actually ends up turning into, after we take a limit as the number of rectangles runs away to infinity, that this turns into an exact expression for the area between A and B underneath a curve F of T. And its symbol is the integral from A to B of f of t dt, because that s symbol literally means sum. Okay, The problem was that in order to compute that, it was a ton of work, and we had to use both sum formulas and limits. Well, that's irritating. It turns out, though, that there is a theorem that tells us how we can undo this. And that theorem is called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. The big question is, how can I compute the integral from a to b of f of t dt quickly? So I don't want to use limits, and I don't want to use the geometry of rectangles to figure this out. I just want some formula that I can use to do this. So we have a little tiny bit of inspiration, which is we know that this works the opposite way that differentiation does. We know that if we start with velocity, that we end up with is x of t, which is a position. And that's backwards from the way differentiation works. So maybe integration and differentiation cancel each other out. Maybe integration and differentiation are inverses. And the answer is they are. So what the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 1 tells us is that integrating and differentiating are opposite. So if you define a function, so we define a function that starts at some number a and goes up to some value x. And in here we write f of t dt. Now what is that? Well, this is a function that spits out areas. So this is a function that outputs areas. You tell me the x, there's a, there's x. You tell me where x is, and that is a function that tells me the area underneath f of t between a and x. Okay, that's the way I want you to interpret that. What the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 1 says is that if you take the derivative of that function, that you get back the original function. So differentiation undoes the integration. It says d by d x of the integral from a to x of f of t dt is just f of x. If I produce a position curve by calculating areas, and then I take derivatives to get back to velocities, I get back the original velocity equation that I started with. So the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 1 tells me that differentiation and integration are canceling operations. The derivative of an integral is the original function. That's a pretty big deal because it tells me I've got some hope about going back and forth between differentiation and integration. So the fundamental theorem calculus part one says that the derivative of an integral is the original function. Okay. The second part is the part that's important for computation. So that answers our first part of our question is, how do we justify that there are actually inverse processes 
Fundamental Th Theorem of Calculus Part 1 tells you that. So the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 2 says, suppose that you have f, which is continuous, at an interval from a to b. You need it to be continuous, because if it's not continuous, things can fall apart. So you have f continuous on an interval from a to b. And um, capital F is an antiderivative of lowercase f. So what is an antiderivative? f is an antiderivative of little f if f prime is equal to little f. So for example, 1 third x to the third is the antiderivative of x squared because d by dx of 1 third x to the third is equal to x squared. So if I know a derivative relationship, I automatically know an antiderivative relationship as well. So that differentiation table that you learned in Calculus 1, you just flip it backwards and you have an anti-differentiation table. So f is an antiderivative of little f. Then the area between a and b underneath little f of x dx is equal to the antiderivative evaluated at b minus the antiderivative evaluated at A. So this is Newton's big discovery and Leibniz's big discovery. It was not just that integration was the opposite process of differentiation, but that there was a very straightforward way of computing it, just using antiderivatives. Okay. So now, how do you do it? Well, let's look at the example that we just had. So we wanted to know the integral or the area starting at t equals 0 and ending at t equals 1 of the curve t squared dt. What the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us is that this should be f of b minus f, sorry, f of 1 minus f of 0 where capital F prime is equal to t squared. Well, that means that capital F must be 1 third t to the third because the derivative of that function is this one. And that says that I should be able to take this function and plug these two numbers in and subtract and get the area. So that is to say, well, f of 1 is 1 third times 1 to the third, and f of 0 is 1 third times 0 to the third, which is 1 third. Notice that's the same answer we got when we did it with sums. Okay. So when we did with this with sums, we also got one third. This computation. When we computed this limit right here, what we computed was the area under the curve and we got one third. But notice with the fundamental theorem of calculus part two is as long as I can find an antiderivative, I can just plug numbers in to find the areas. Well, that's an amazingly powerful idea. If I can find an antiderivative of f, this is easy because the fundamental theorem of calculus part two says that all I need to do is plug numbers into the antiderivative. So the key is how do I find an antiderivative? It's a key question. Is I start with an area. Remember this is an area. And I want to use the fundamental theorem of calculus part two to turn it into a very simple subtraction problem. Question, how do I find capital F? Well, 
How do I find an antiderivative? So the easy answer is that I flip the differentiation table. Because if integration is the opposite of differentiation, and I have a table of derivatives, I also have a table of antiderivatives. So you can think about this as the function, in which case this is the derivative. So here's a derivative table you should know. So what do you learn derivatives of? The derivative of a constant is 0. If f of x is equal to c, f prime of x was equal to 0. If f of x is equal to x to the n, then f prime of x is equal to n x to the n minus 1. If f of x is equal to the sine of x, f prime of x is equal to the cosine of x. If f of x is equal to the cosine of x, f prime of x is equal to minus the sine of x. If f of x is equal to the tangent of x, f prime of x is equal to the secant squared of x. If f of x is equal to e to the x, then f prime of x is equal to e to the x. That's a magic fact, by the way. And if f of x is equal to the natural log of x, then f prime of x was equal to 1 over x. So this is like a calculus 1 differentiation table. But notice it also gives you antiderivatives. If this is the function, then these are derivatives. But that means that if this thing is the function, then what's over here is the antiderivatives. So the antiderivative of the cosine is the sine. And the antiderivative of secant squared is the tangent. So I'd really like a symbol to represent the idea of antiderivatives. And because of the fundamental theorem of calculus, because this thing, the idea of antiderivatives, appears in the fundamental theorem of calculus, we designate antiderivatives with the same symbol, but with the numbers left off. Because it's a shorthand for the fact that these are used in the fundamental theorem of calculus. So if f of x is equal to the secant squared of x, and capital F of x is equal to the tangent of x, f is an antiderivative of little f. Well, I don't want to write that every time. I want a mathematical symbol for it. So instead, what I say is the integral of secant squared of x dx is equal to the tangent of x. I put the plus c here because there's lots of functions that if I take their derivative, I get secant squared. Because remember, the derivative of constant is nothing. So f is an antiderivative of little f is the same as saying that the integral of little f is equal to capital F. Okay. So this is called an indefinite integral. And we compute indefinite integrals because they are useful indefinite integrals. If I can compute indefinite integrals, then that means I can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. If I can compute an indefinite integral, say I had a situation that looked like the integral from 0 to pi over 3 of the secant squared of x dx, what that means is instead I can evaluate this with this fact, tangent of x with, on the one hand, a 0 plugged in, and on the other hand, a pi over 3 plugged in. So this thing is just shorthand for the tangent of pi over 3 minus the tangent of 0. It's a way of storing the fact that you've computed the integral, but you haven't plugged the numbers in yet. So the idea is the ability to compute antiderivatives is what lets us compute definite integrals. If I can do indefinite integrals, I can do areas. So what is Math 142 all about? Why Math 142? Lots of functions don't 
have obvious antiderivatives. That's point one. Point two is some functions don't have them, at least not formulas for them. So if you wrote down f of x is equal to e to the x squared, there is nothing that you can say for a capital F that is an antiderivative. And the problem is, uh, I need to be able to compute with these things if I want to compute the areas that show up in physics and engineering problems. I need to be able to find antiderivatives or at least come up with ways of approximating them. And what Math 142 and part of Math 143 are about is how do we deal with functions that are not from this table? If they're on the table, it's easy to do an integral. If they're not on the table, it's not easy. Okay. So the whole point of Math 142 is to answer the question, how do I find the capital F if I'm given the lowercase f? And everything we've done up into this class so far, so u substitution, uh, is a technique of integration that's meant to expand the library of functions that we know antiderivatives for. Because the more antiderivatives we can find, the more areas and volumes we can calculate. Okay, so that's sort of an introduction to the ideas of uh, integral calculus and its connections to differential calculus. And I hope that you find it enlightening. I'm more than happy to expand on uh, any of the topics that I, I've mentioned here. Uh, the sections in the book that you want to look at that correspond to this are 4.1 through 4.4. All right, see you.